Welcome. So this lecture will be one of many, hopefully you'll be watching this semester, uh, dealing with chapter 18 to start. So we're starting where we left off last semester uh, in the textbook. Everything you've learned last semester is relevant. Uh, you'll see some old topics pop up during these lectures, but we're going to move on with uh, chapter 18, dealing with charge and its conservation. So, Electromagnetic magnetic forces are very much like gravitational forces that we addressed earlier. It's a force that exists in nature. In fact, it's one of the four fundamental forces of the universe. Gravity is a fundamental force that you're all intimately familiar with, right? All of you are bound by gravity to this planet. You've never woken up one morning and found that gravity had turned off. So you all have experience with gravity, dropping objects and so on. Electromagnetic force is the other force that you have experience with, although you might not know it as obviously uh, as with gravity. Electromagnetic force controls atoms and molecules and the interaction between them. Atoms are mostly empty space, but for example, when I push on this board, uh, my hand doesn't pass through the board because the electrons in my hand are pushing against the electrons in the board. There's an electromagnetic force between them. In fact, atoms exist because of this force. Negatively charged electrons orbit around positively charged nuclei, and the positive charge comes from the protons of the nucleus. So electromagnetic force is one of the four forces of nature. We'll learn about the other two later on this semester. The uh, strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. Both of those we do not have a direct experience with on the macroscopic scale. Electromagnetic forces were hinted at early on from the properties that ancient people saw that some objects like amber received when you were to rub it with, for example, silk. If you take a piece of amber and you rub it with silk, you charge that piece of amber. And what does that mean? Well, it attracts bits of metal it affects a compass needle if you bring that amber too close. And in fact, the Greek word for amber gives us the modern uh, word electron. Testing the electromagnetic force, we find that while you can charge objects, like rubbing amber with, actually not silk, rubbing amber with uh, animal fur, or rubbing a glass rod with silk, will charge up these objects. But there always seems to be two types of charge. There's the charge that the amber receives and then the charge that the uh, animal fur receives. And they're equal and opposite. So we call these types of charge positive charge and negative charge. So that's it. There, an object can be positively charged, an object can be not charged at all or neutral, or an object can be negatively charged. There are no other options available. If objects have the same charge, so two positive charges or two negative charges, these objects will repel one another. So for example, if I charge up a bit of amber and I suspend it from an insulated wire and I bring another piece of charged amber nearby, those two pieces will push apart. A piece of a string will actually push apart. If I have opposite charges, unlike charges, then there's an attractive force between them. This is slightly different than gravity. Gravity affects anything with mass. And gravity, excuse me, is an attractive force, always an attractive force. So there's no repulsion for gravity. The electromagnetic force has an attractive component where you have two unlike charged objects, a positive and a negative charge. Or there's repulsion if you have two similarly charged objects objects that are both positively charged or objects that are both negatively charged. Modern physics has shown that charge is a fundamental property of matter, like mass is. An electron has a very specific mass, and all electrons have exactly the same mass. All protons have exactly the same mass. All neutrons have exactly the same mass all of these particles that make up the atom are interchangeable. If you take one electron away and replace it with another electron, you wouldn't be able to know the difference. Charge 
is likewise a fundamental property of matter. All electrons have the same charge. All protons have the same charge. All neutrons have the same charge, which is zero. They're neutral, hence the term neutron. Electrons are negatively charged, and protons are positively charged. Now, this convention between negative and positive is arbitrary. Ben Franklin decided to call the charge left on an amber rod, I believe, a positive charge, and the charge left on the animal for a negative charge. I believe that was the order. He could have easily flipped it. And in fact, he did flip it. It would make, it make our lives a lot easier, we would learn. Uh, but that ship has long sailed. Electrons are negative charges. Protons are positive charges. Now, not only are all protons positively charged, the positive charge of a proton exactly matches the negative charge on an electron in magnitude. They're exactly the same, only opposite in sign. So the magnitude of the charge, now charge is going to be often represented in your textbook and in the problems I work on as a Q. A lowercase q usually means a charge on a particle. An uppercase q can sometimes be a charge on an extended object. The charge uh, E, usually for an electron, the absolute value because we want to know what the magnitude of the charge is. Sometimes this quantity is just represented by E, the letter E, lowercase e. It's equal to 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So this capital C, this capital C represents the unit of charge, the SI unit of charge, called the coulomb. As you can see, this charge on an individual electron is incredibly small. But when you're talking about coulombs of charge in real life, that means that you have a lot of electrons either present or absent. So when an object is charged, it means that the electrons have been added to the object or electrons have been removed from the object. The object gains a negative charge when it gets extra electrons, and it gains a positive charge when electrons are removed. Now, in an atom or in a substance, typically a positive charge comes about from the presence of protons without matched electrons. What do I mean by that? Well, think of an object that's neutral. If I want to add a negative charge to that, I can't remove protons. If I remove protons, I'm removing some of the substance, the atoms that make up the substance. Electrons can be easily removed and easily replaced. So electrons are the thing in an atom that move. So if you have, for example, a copper wire, it's the electrons that flow in that wire, not the positive protons. The positive protons are in a lattice structure, basically. They're part of the copper itself. They are the copper and don't move as electricity flows in a copper wire. The electrons are what move. So if you want to positively charge something, you pull electrons away from it. If you want to negatively charge something, you add electrons. There's a fun saying in chemistry. It's protons give an element its identity. Electrons give it its personality. Now, because charge is a fundamental property of nature, it cannot appear and disappear at will. Or if it does, it has to balance. You cannot just create an electron out of nothing, a negative charge out of nothing, without creating a positive charge as well. Charge is have to be conserved. But remember, there's negative and positive charge. So if I start off with zero, and I create an electron, that means I create a positive charge as well. That positive charge is called a positron. We, we'll talk about that later on in this class. That's antimatter. For the purposes of this chapter, the following chap few chapters, elect we're not going to create or destroy matter. A charge cannot appear or disappear then. It has to be conserved. So if I remove the electrons and make an object positively charged, those electrons have to go somewhere. Or if I add electrons to make a charge, an object negatively charged, those electrons have to come from somewhere. I cannot just magically make them appear or disappear.